is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hello again, everyone. This is Chip Brogdon coming to you with another edition of our weekly webcast. I'm streaming online at www.watchman.net. And this week we are continuing our series of messages from the book of Hebrews. And actually, we will be concluding our study of the book of Hebrews. What a powerful, exciting, and eye-opening time this has been to really get into the depth of the word here in Hebrews and see uh, three things basically and I would just like to reiterate them again. Number one, that Jesus is our high priest. Number two, that he is the mediator of a new covenant. And number three, that his sacrifice is the final sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. And in him and through him and unto him, we are well-pleasing to God. Not in ourselves, not because we keep the law or because we're able to satisfy God in and of ourselves, but it says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.17 or 5.21 that we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves, and that is the entire strength of this new covenant. A better covenant established upon better promises. And so we concluded last week with Hebrews uh, chapter 12. We almost got through Hebrews 12 this week. Of course, we'll finish chapter 12 and proceed on to the end of chapter 13 and then close out this study of the book of Hebrews. So uh, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer right now and ask Him to bless this time that we have together in the Word. We thank you, Lord for the spirit and truth wisdom that is revealed here in the scripture with this wonderful, powerful book of Hebrews that helps us to understand the purpose of the Old Covenant, the purpose of the New Covenant, and how both of these covenants are pointing us to Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of our faith, as the fulfillment and the satisfaction of everything that the law demands. I thank you that it is all fulfilled and completed in Christ, and that to the extent that we will accept him as our high priest, our mediator, our our sacrifice, to that extent, we too will be well-pleasing to you because uh, we will be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And it's by grace and not by our works. And I pray, Lord, if, if anyone is listening and they're still bound by religion, they're still bound by the old covenant and still bound by sabbath days and by circumcision and by tithing and all of these other accoutrements of the old covenant that you would open their eyes and you would help them to see the the supremacy and the preeminence of relating to you as a new covenant believer as an in christed believer as a God of grace and not of God, not a God of, of law. Uh, instead, Lord, that all of us would learn to live and move and have our being in Christ and would obey the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is to walk after the Spirit and is to walk by faith. And that is the new covenant that you have provided for us. And thank you so much for that. And I pray, Lord, that as we finish out this study in Hebrews, that uh, it would produce fruit in our lives and that we would be set free forever from the, from the shadow of the old covenant and instead would embrace this new covenant, which is light and truth and reality. And I thank you for your spirit which teaches us and leads us into all truth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Well, Hebrews chapter 12, and we left off last week 
with that wonderful illustration of the difference between coming to the mountain of the Old Testament versus coming to Mount Zion in the New Testament and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So that was Hebrews uh, 12. 22 through 24, and when it talks about New Jerusalem and it talks about the city of God and the assembly of the church, uh, it, it doesn't take a lot of, of intelligence to be able to connect the dots to the last few chapters of Revelation and see everything that God purposed being fulfilled. We see that city of God, we see the New Jerusalem, and I'll, I'll tell you something else, folks, there's a, there's a lot of teaching and a lot of emphasis being placed on the bride of Christ, but we see in Revelation the bride of Christ is the new Jerusalem, and we are that bride. We are that new Jerusalem. We are the church that Jesus is building. It's not a thing. It is a people. It is a, a living. It's really hard to describe other than to say it is a oneness, a union between Christ and and the body between Christ and the bride, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, the heavenly general assembly of the church, and everything that that encompasses. And, and how, how wonderful that is compared to the earthly substitute that sometimes we get focused on and we get sidetracked by. Earthly Jerusalem, the earthly church, the church building, or the earthly uh, things that make up religious orders or religious systems. Uh, how much better it is to really get a vision and get a purpose uh, in your spirit, in your heart, in, in your mind, in your very being of what God's purpose is, what His intention is, and then we really have something that we can walk in and, and apply and live, and it will be spirit and truth and life to us and to those around us. So we resume with Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25. says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. In other words, we are going through a, a season in God's dealings with man in which he is shaking everything that can be shaken. And for the Christians in that time, God was shaking the very foundations of Judaism the Old Covenant and the Law of Moses and everything that that meant, he was readjusting them and repurposing them in, into something more closely aligned with his heart and his mind and his will. And once again, folks, I'm not saying that God has a plan B and when plan A fails, then God implements plan B. I'm saying that when God begins something, he completes it and he finishes it, but a lot of times we take something and we get distracted, we go off in another direction, or we take something just like they did and we make a golden calf out of it and God has to move us on. The, the Spirit is propelling us and pushing us ever, ever more uh, centrally focused onto Jesus Christ. And a lot of times... I know this is true of me, and it's it's true of a lot of people. At some time or another, we get distracted from the simplicity of Christ. And we may get caught up in other little side trails and other little side teaching, teachings, pet doctrines and pet movements. And, yeah, God uses those things, but eventually those things have to point us back to Jesus. And if we allow those things to replace Jesus and become more preeminent in our lives, God will touch those things. That's exactly what happened with Judaism, the way they were practicing it. 
And naturally, when Jesus came, he repudiated all of that, and he got right to the heart of the matter, as opposed to the letter of the law. He emphasized the spirit of the law. Well, that's exactly what the New Covenant is about. It's about obeying God from the heart, as opposed to obeying God legalistically or ritualistically through some type of an outward system of worship. So God is shaking those things, and he's I just have to say it. He's trying to shake you if you're still relating to him in an old covenant way. He wants to relate to you in a new covenant way. And perhaps, just perhaps, he's using this website and this webcast and these teachings to stir you up and to shake you. Now, a lot of people, they're going to reject this you know, right off the bat just because it doesn't flow with what they've always been taught and it doesn't really agree with their preconceived idea of things. But you need to really take it before the Lord and pray about it. Maybe you're not ready for it, but maybe you are. Maybe God's trying to shake you up a little bit so that he can be all in all in you. And, you know, Scripture says that's what's going to happen. Now, verse 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. Here's that word grace again. You've got to love it. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And we really need to get back in touch with the majesty of God, and we really need to have a little more reverence for God than we do. Uh, this familiarity with the Lord is good from a friendship and a communion standpoint. Certainly he's our friend. Certainly he's our counselor. And certainly we can speak uh, back and forth with him and commune with him. But at, at some point we've got to recognize that our God is a consuming fire. And you just don't treat the Lord with the same level of reverence and dignity uh, that that you do with a ordinary person. Uh, in, in other words, I think we take holy things for granted too many times. And we need to get back in touch with that sense of majesty and reverence for the Lord. And yes, he's our friend, but he's also our master, and he's also our Lord, and he is a consuming fire. And he is a living fire. And his eyes are a flame of fire. And... and um, so that this, there's just so many attributes and dimensions and levels uh, to the Lord, and it's, it's going to take eternity to explore all of them. But uh, that consuming fire is such a powerful thing, and that consuming fire, it burns up, and it destroys, and it, le- it lays waste, and it decreases you, so that God can then begin to build something in you that cannot be shaken, which is the kingdom of God, a place where Jesus has the preeminence in all things. So praise God for that. If you don't understand God's purposes, you'll be afraid of that fire. If you understand his purposes, you can cooperate with that consuming fire and let that consuming fire engulf you and embrace you and decrease you. Go ahead and and step into death so that the life of the Lord Jesus may be manifest in you and through you. Praise the Lord. Well, Hebrews chapter 13. Now we're going to close out Hebrews with some very practical direction. Uh, Verse 1 of Hebrews 13, let brotherly love continue. Because, folks, you can have all this figured out, but if you don't love one another, it profits you nothing, Paul said. So let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So praise the Lord. And then uh, verse 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Now, it, it's he, he's talking about people who rule over you. People, I, I think it would be a, a better way to translate this uh, to say that those who serve you, uh, meaning serving in some type of a leadership capacity in the body of Christ. Yes, there is such a thing as leadership in the church that Jesus is building. 
But we need to really, we can't do it today, but we really need to go back and redefine a lot of these terms that we use like leadership and rule over and authority. And what do these terms mean and how, how should we use those terms in the context of the church? What does it mean to show leadership? Well, to me, leadership is just simply someone who is out in front. It doesn't mean someone better. It doesn't mean someone higher. It doesn't mean someone worthy of more or less respect than anyone else. It doesn't mean someone who is better. It simply means someone who is in front of, someone who has gone before. If I am leading an expedition, it means I am simply the first one in line. I am leading the expedition and other people are following along behind me. So the way I see Scripture is that real leadership, real godly leadership, first of all, it is serving the people, not expecting to be served by the people. It is serving the church with your gift instead of expecting the church to serve you because of your gift. And it seems like we've got it completely backwards that the people who who believe they are leaders, who believe they are gifted, they are the ones most of the time sitting up on the platform, getting everyone's applause, and thinking that everything is supposed to revolve around them and what they're doing. When actually, those who are called to be leaders in the body of Christ, in the church that Jesus is building, they are actually supposed to be servants. And the leading is done by example, not by dictatorship, not by giving orders and giving commands. You lead by example. And and what is the example? It's the example of love. It's the example of laying down your life. It's the example of serving others. It's the example of humility and all the fruits of the Spirit operating in someone's life. And it implies, to me at least, that if someone is called to be a leader, it means they've experienced a depth in God I have yet to experience. It means they have some wisdom and some some knowledge that I don't have. They have some gifts and some skills that I don't have that I can benefit from. And so in that area, I am quite willing to, to allow them to lead me so that I can go deeper into Christ. At the same time, I am not going to follow anyone or be led by anyone or anything that is not taking me into a deeper, more experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. So th- there is a place for leadership, and I, I think you're, you're making a mistake if you try to get rid of leadership altogether. We don't need to eliminate leadership. We need to redefine it according to the Spirit, according to Scripture. And, you know, even if 100% of People who are called to be leaders have missed it. That doesn't mean you get rid of leadership. You just need to go back and and rediscover what true, biblical, scriptural, spirit-led, and Christ-centered leadership is all about. In some small way, I'm trying to provide that with our website and with the School of Christ and with Watchman.net and with these teachings and with the workshops that we do. I'm trying to point people to Jesus, but you can't point someone to someone or something that you don't know anything about. So at some point, we have to recognize that some people know more than we know. Some people have been places we haven't been, and it takes wisdom and maturity to recognize that and just be able to acquiesce to that other person and let them teach you some things. There's nothing wrong with that. It's only when it becomes abused that we need to address it and we need to we need to shut that person down and we need to hold them uh, into account. So let's move on. Verse 8 of Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And praise God for that. And that's why I say God doesn't have a plan B, a plan C. You know, if B doesn't work, plan C kicks in. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you go back and look in the Old Testament, all of those promises are concerning Christ. They're not concerning Israel. They're not concerning the church. Israel and the church are simply part of God's plan, but God's plan and His purpose revolves around Jesus Christ. And that that point is so undebatable. It, it is It is beyond dispute. It is beyond discussion. God's purpose... And his will and his intention from the very beginning is that Jesus Christ would have the preeminence in all things. And the church has a part to play in that. Israel has a part to play in that. The whole world has a part to play in that. Even the devil has a part to play in that because he is working all things together according to that purpose. 
So Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse 9, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, there's that word grace again, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, verse 13, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Now, this is a very interesting thing to consider here. Uh, outside the camp is a good way to illustrate what it means to to turn your back on and step out of their Jewishness, their social structure, their political structure, their religious structure, and to go and be identified with Jesus outside the camp. Now, outside the camp is where those those sacrifices were made, but it's also a place of reproach. You'll you recall that when Miriam had leprosy, she was confined outside the camp. So it's a place of reproach. And if you're not willing to be identified with Jesus in that reproach, then you will also not be identified with him in the victory and in the overcutting. Uh, it, there is a cost associated with being a disciple of Jesus. And so uh, Paul is basically saying it's going to cost you everything that you have. And yes, you'll be excommunicated. Yes, you'll find yourself outside the the camp, out, outside the gate, outside the established order of things, as Paul certainly experienced and as every disciple of the Lord will experience. Now, the application to us today is when you really get a revelation of who Jesus is and you really begin to challenge and question the things that are being done in his name when they do not, in fact, accurately and honestly represent Jesus Christ. And that includes just about everything that's being done in the name of religion, in denominationalism, in the, the system of churchianity, I like to call it. Churchianity today, which in my opinion, and I'm entitled to my opinion because I believe it's the truth, that organized religion represents the single greatest distraction from the simplicity of Christ that I know of. It was true in, the, in Jesus' day. It's just as true 2,000 years ago. But we have taken the things of Jesus. We have taken a religion about Jesus. And we have made that to be the preeminent thing instead of Jesus himself. A religion about Jesus has become more important than a relationship with Jesus. I'll say that again. A religion about Jesus has become more important than a relationship with Jesus. And when that happens, someone has to stand up and say, this is wrong. This does not represent God's heart. This is a distraction from the simplicity of Christ. And someone needs to stand up for that simplicity. And if I'm the only one that's going to do it, I know I'm not. But I'm just saying, if I'm the only one to do that, I'm quite happy and content to do that. But you know what? If you decide that you're going to to speak out and speak the truth, you're going to find yourself alienated from other people. You don't have to separate yourself from them. They separate themselves from you. And some people just cannot handle that. If, if you crave fellowship, if you crave everyone agreeing with you, if you crave being adulated and, and having pats on the back from other people, you're not going to make it very long as a disciple of Jesus. Because I'm telling you, the deeper into God you go, the more you're going to find people who don't understand, who don't appreciate it, who don't get it, and and your very life, your very testimony begins to repudiate everything they stand for, and they 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 do not want that kind of person in their life anymore. And so I'm I'm encouraging you on the one hand, but I'm also cautioning you on the other. The scripture does the same thing. If we go forth to him and he's outside the camp, we will bear his reproach as well. And you'll recall Jesus said the same thing to his disciples, that the time will come when they'll cast you out of the synagogues and they'll think that they are doing God a service. Well, 
I can take that same word of Jesus and apply it to his disciples today. The time will come, and the time is now, when they'll kick you out of church, and they'll kick you out of the ministerial association, and they'll kick you out of the denomination, thinking they're doing God's work, and they don't, even, they don't have a clue who the Lord is. And they are unwilling to listen because they've hardened their hearts and they've hardened their minds and they've closed their ears and they will not open their eyes and and allow the Spirit of Jesus to speak truth to them because their consciences have been seared. Now, is that who you want to be identified with? Or do you want to be identified with Spirit and life, Spirit and truth, Jesus? They're outside the camp. I'd rather be with Jesus outside the camp than be inside the camp without him. I mean, that, that's just the bottom line. So, verse, uh, verse 14, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So, again, an Old Testament reference. Every day they had to offer up sacrifices, morning and evening, for their sins, We no longer have to do that, Paul says, but instead we can offer up continually the sacrifice of praise to the Lord and the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Praise God. And also another way to make sacrifices in this new covenant. Verse 16, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So you see, it's, it's not eliminating it's going to the next level. That's what the new covenant does. So uh, you've got the one sacrifice of Jesus for our sins, and then our daily sacrifice, our daily function and role as priests in this new kingdom, in this new covenant, is to offer up the sacrifice of praise. Isn't that a big improvement over offering up a, a goat or a bull or a cow or a turtle dove? I think that's a major improvement. And then to share and to do good to one another. Those are sacrifices with which God is pleased, it says. So the new covenant is completely different from the old. It goes beyond the old and it fulfills not just the letter but the spirit of the law as well. Verse 17, Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. And again, there's another opportunity to take that and twist it around and use it for a purpose for which it was not intended. Obey those who rule over you. Well, question is, who rules over you? Who do you allow to rule over you? Who has the right to rule over you? I would suggest it's a very small, limited number of people. Uh, Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. What if someone's ruling over you and they're not watching out for your soul? What if they have their best interests in mind and not your own? Well, obviously you're not to submit to those. So if you've got that kind of problem in your life, then you need to write me and let me know so that so we can give you some wisdom and counsel for your, your situation. Uh, but certainly you can't take this scripture, lift it out, and try to use it in a way that many uh, so-called men of God and women of God have done in the past. Praise the Lord. Verse 18, Hebrews 13, Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a powerful benediction that is, because again, it's not saying it's up to you to figure all this out and make it happen. It is up to you to allow the Spirit of Jesus to do his will through you and to work in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. He will do it through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 22, I appeal to you, brethren, bear with me. Or bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you, and all the saints, those from Italy, greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. 
and amen. Well, praise the Lord. I hope you got something out of that study. I'm a little sad to see it come to a close, but I know Hebrews is right there in the New Testament. We can turn to it and read it and study it and profit from it whenever we wish. So I hope this has been an encouragement and a source of blessing and fruitfulness to you. This is Chip Brogdon streaming online at www.watchman.net. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you.